Yeah, the best way. Hey everyone, this is John Reed. This is official workshop show. <laughs> uh, see, we're going real seat of the pants today, but I got Thomas Weber Knight here, so all is not lost. And you got a whiteboard, so we can really workshop. Yeah, absolutely. Probably should have practiced your name pronunciation a couple more times before him. But anyhow, we are on to the next semantical problem, which is hyper-personalization. Uh, thanks for joining me on this. Um, we had, we had, you and I have had some really good conversations on this, both on and off the record. And for some reason, this topic keeps coming up in a pretty potent way for me. <laughs> and uh, I want to explain a little bit to our listeners why that, why I think this matters. And but. Uh, if you're participating in this chat, please feel free to start airing out your opinions and grievances. I don't know how many people will have because I just sent out an invite blast just now. But anyhow, the reason this kind of came up for me again, having looked at this issue many times before, was because I was listening to a pretty interesting podcast, AI Today, put on by a, a firm called Cognolytica that does a lot of AI project work. And they have developed what they call this their seven patterns of AI, which includes, by the way, hyper-personalization. Um, we're going to get back to the semantical debate briefly around that term, so don't, don't worry. Uh, but, but anyway, they, they, have, they define seven patterns of artificial intelligence, including hyper-personalization. You can look it up on their site, but in, the other ones include autonomous systems, predictive analytics, conversation, human interaction pattern, recognition, and goal-driven systems. So you're saying, well, who cares? That's just an analyst firm. Okay, fine. But that became the basis for the EU AI Act's um, important legislation. They actually referred to those patterns of AI when they were trying to come up with a lot of their regulatory and risk frameworks. And obviously, hyper-personalization gets deeply implicated in this because there is no hyper-personalization without data. <laughs> And some of that data is pretty private and personal. So, uh, so anyway, that that kind of got my ear up. And then there was a statement made um, by one of the Cognolytica hosts uh, that kind of got me a little bit riled up. Um, although they do a good job on their podcast, it's Kathleen Welch and Ronald Schmelzer are the host, and I think it was Kathleen, maybe, but the one to pick on Kathleen because it might have been Ronald. But they were talking about how convenient hyper personalization can be because. Now you get exactly what you want from companies and not anything else. And of course, that really kind of got me aggravated. To be fair to them, they, 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 they look hard at the pros and cons of this. So, um, But that statement kind of made me feel like, well, we need to kind of revisit this a little bit because this term is, is actually, and what it represents is important. And then along those same lines, I feel like a lot of the things I want to talk about don't get enough discussion. I'll give you some examples of things I want to talk about Things like, do you need a real-time context? Uh, why is it more than just a tool? Saying it's a tool, why isn't that good enough? What about the creep factor in personalization? What about this notion of overreach? Uh, and, and, and how does overreach get us into trouble? Why is collateral damage of alienating customers acceptable? Why or why not? Those are some of the topics that I think are important, especially in, mm -hmm. a, B2B, in a B2B context. So I have Thomas here to talk through some of this stuff. So Thomas, we're going to get into the semantics in a minute, but I just want to sort of get off the top of your head. What, what are you thinking right now about this topic as we head into our little workshop here? <laughs> well, starting off with, as you know, this, the term sounds far better when, than one-to-one -one marketing, right? So, yeah. And in, in general, if, if I'm looking into what personalization in general is used for, it is mostly for the one who personalizes, not for the one who gets personalized. Right. So it means the recipient, yeah. Because the, the yeah. customer is mostly, well, treated as an object. And that grieves me. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and so, so in many ways, I think it's interesting because Obviously, no one walks around saying, man, I wish I had more hyper-personalization in my life. So this is obviously one of those words that we have to be a little careful with yeah. because people don't say they want that. But then again, people don't generally say, I wish I had more one-on-one -on -one marketing in my life either. Um, yeah. I do want to attempt to define the term a little bit, however. Um, yeah. so, so personalization as I see it, the way we're going to use the terms today, personalization as I see it is 
is is basically a failed attempt at hyper-personalization. So personalization is really segmentation. It's really kind of the classic example of trying to get me excited based on the fact that I'm segmented with certain mm-hmm. groups that share similar interests. So hyper-personalization is one last shot at trying to really get like what matters to you or me mm-hmm. into my life in a way that I'm going to action and to do it at scale. And I want to read to you a little bit from uh, AI today on this because I want to see what you think of their uh, definition of this because I think it's kind of interesting. And 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 obviously, you don't necessarily need AI to do these things. But AI is obviously very tempting for people because some obvious reasons of maybe doing a better job of this. And so from, one, from their AI Today glossary series, I'm going to quote this part. This idea of hyper-personalization, which is this pattern of AI to really build a unique profile of each individual based on their very specific characteristics. So this idea of hyper-personalization is to create a profile that can evolve over time rather than categorizing or bucketing an individual in a predefined category or in a less intelligent category. Mm. Um, So it's not underfitting or overfitting, but essentially the perfect quote-unquote fit for every individual. And I think that's interesting, Thomas, because whether or not AI can help us with this or not, I think we can sort of accept the idea that it's interesting to move beyond static segments, right, into something a little more dynamic, right, that is mm-hmm. evolving over time. That's an interesting goal, right? It It is for the one who uses it. So, right. I mean, what differentiates it from... Don't differentiate hyper-personalization from the old school term that I just used and deliberately used. I could have said right. individualization as well. The, the, there are two differences. One is now, in contrast to the 80s of the last millennium, we have the horsepower. means the, the sheer computing grunt that makes it possible to create profiles of one. And second is we have the, the algorithms. Well, some of the algoris- al- algorithms, my God, didn't have enough coffee. So some of those algorithms haven't been th- have been there since probably the 50s and the 60s, but they just couldn't be in a run because of the lacking horsepower. And, and now we have the combination. So this can be used. It also can be used for good purposes. Right. And now we are in the usual discussion between what tools can be used for, right? The gun proponents say has a, the right. gun is not the bad thing, it's the user. And it's pretty much the same. Yeah, and yeah. so so I think this is useful. And so we're going to kind of put to the side whether or not this is really different from one-to-one marketing because essentially I think we can accept that it's sort of the same. Um dressed up in some in some new clothes but with like you said some new horsepower some new technologies so we're just going to call it hyper personalization for today um you and i don't sell this stuff so it doesn't really matter what we call it we're not trying to sell our viewers on anything i just don't want to talk about semantics for an hour because i don't think that's interesting so for the rest of the hour we're calling it hyper personalization if you don't like that term and cringe (laughs) all i got to tell you is that i think one one one-on-one marketing is a pretty a clunky no. term too so i think we're we're still back in the tool shed there but i think what's interesting because yesterday when you and i were talking about this we t- we kind of agreed that this is just a tool right but the difference that i was saying is that yeah but unlike like a hammer or a screwdriver this is a tool that that we really don't understand exactly what it is we need to define what it's good for and what it's not. It's not self-explanatory, mm-hmm. right? Because there's there's a lot of overhype around what hyper-personalization can do. And I, want, and I want to explain a little bit about some of the reasons why I think there's some serious problems here. Um, but I also want to say that I do think that it can work. And I've actually seen it work in my life. So I want to talk a little bit about the times where you and I have actually had effective experiences with hyper-personalization, because I think that's really yeah. interesting. I think one of the reasons why I, I reacted strongly to this Cognolytica statement around only getting the offers that I need is I think part of the problem we have here is that even if that were, let's say that were possible, that you could do that, I still think a lot of vendors are are going to have a hard time resisting not blasting me with other stuff because it's cheap, it's affordable, 
and why not, right? So in other words, let's say I have a a 60% chance of responding to a a so-called hyper-personalized offer and only a 35% chance of responding to a segmented offer. Those are probably pretty high percentages, especially if you think of like Mm. an email kind of a thing. But but at any rate, the point being like, marketers are still going to want to send me the 35% stuff too. (laughs) Because, you know, I think in a lot of cases they will, right? Because they're going to be like, well, that's still pretty good. I can still work with that. And so even if they're sending me successful hyper-personalized emails, which by the way, I don't think I've ever received a successful Mm. hyper-personalized email, though I'm told that Starbucks sends good ones. So I've never gotten one, but but that's an example where Starbucks actually does this, right? Like they Mm. they send so-called hyper-personalized emails that are drawn from your recent purchase history, right? That are inspired by the things you've recently been doing instead of just like generic coupon. My point is, Thomas, that yeah. our marketer is really going to step back and say, oh no, don't don't send John and Thomas these discount offers because they're not hyper-personalized. Only send the hyper-personalized stuff. I don't, <laughs> buy, that for, I don't buy that for a second. No, but, uh, but you also implicitly mentioned the other problem with hyper-personalization or personalization as such, it's based on the history. So who says that I want to have a Frappuccino with whatever taste right now because, just because I had one last week or the right. week before or the week before last or end the week before last? Right now I might just be into a plain black filtered coffee because I just need the caffeine. Yeah. So the, the what is missing, especially when personalization and hyper-personalization are used in email blasts, is the actual context. The, and right. this is where systems like, where the poster child is TikTok right now, where, where they can really excel because they show you what you want to see whenever you want to see and they are basing that on right up to the minute experience. Or well, they are right up to the minute experience. Their measure. They do know precisely what I want at this time, and they show that to me. To a lesser extent, your other example that you mentioned in our pre-conversation, YouTube, they're pretty good as, as well. Yep. And I want to get I want to get to mm. why those examples mm. yeah. are working yeah. and during our workshop today yeah. for sure. <laughs> This thing around context I want to mention briefly because this is really important. Yeah. Probably the favorite video show I ever ever did was uh, a, a debate with Matthew Sweezy who wrote a really important book called The Context Marketing Revolution. And before that, he put out a, a really a pretty amazing short-term podcast series called The Electronic Propaganda Society that essentially yeah. talked about the, sh- yeah. the massive shifts in marketing. Yeah. And and uh, if you ever have a chance, check out that video debate with the two of us. Like I'm saying that to my audience because it's really interesting. It brings these issues to a head, I think, around like, first of all, like, can AI actually get our real-time context right? And I'm going to argue that it cannot get it perfectly right. And And that's not just because AI is somewhat limited in certain ways still, that's not the main reason. The main reason is because human beings are too individually difficult in that regard. The example I used yesterday, I think is interesting where like, like, and why I think YouTube can be very effective for me personally, because I, I use one YouTube login for pretty much all of my consumption uh, on on Google and on YouTube, mm. except except for I'll intentionally use an anonymous browser if I'm looking at stuff that I know is like a one time interest because mm. I don't I don't want the algorithm to pick up on that and mess up yep. too much. But um, but in general, everything that I'm interested in, YouTube factors into its algorithm. One of the reasons why I think it works, and some people might say this is recommendation engine, not hyper personalization. For the purposes of our discussion today, I'm just going to combine them into into one concept because I think they're similar enough. But basically, what YouTube does that I think works really well is instead of trying to tell me watch this video and playing playing a video for me, it's basically letting me see a whole range of possible videos that I might be interested in based on prior interests in history, and so like. 
the reason that's so effective is because mm -hmm. my context changed so quickly. Like uh, the thing I was saying about like a conversation yesterday is what if in the middle of the conversation, mostly I'm thinking about work and video and hyper personalization, but what if in the middle of that, like I get a text from an ex of mine and I hadn't heard from that person in a long time and it kind of makes me emotional or whatever. As soon as I get off our conversation, my whole context has changed. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and so for AI to try to predict, like, or, or my mom messages me, suddenly she has co COVID and I'm worried about her, or, you know, she needs the solar glasses that I sent her that haven't arrived yet, which is like for real, right? Yeah. Um, real, real thing that's happening now. Uh, where are my solar glasses? Uh, the eclipse is coming. Like, AI can't possibly like guess all of that perfectly. The reason why I think YouTube works so well for me is because it doesn't try to totally guess. It gives me a range of choices without interrupting me. Mm. And it allows me to pick from those range of choices, like what's going to fit my mood the best. And it doesn't try to overthink it. And where I was getting into a big argument with Matthew Sweezy about this is especially, I'm going to make the argument that especially for B2B purchasing decisions, AI doesn't need to guess the real-time context. Now for consumers, it's a little bit different because you know, a lot of consumer purchases, you're doing it today, right? So the chance yeah. to influence you is right now. It's it's when, Thomas, it's when you're shopping for that backpack or it's when you're in the store. Yeah. So I think that's what's really interesting. And that's why people are salivating over this is they want to figure out how to influence you, Thomas, in real time, right? It's about and, real time. And this is also where the chances that the artificial guess is better because Take the example of a website. Yeah, you have the click stream on this very website, which usually gives an intention, right? Because you have an intention, right? If it's just browsing, yeah, but even that is recognizable. So, and if if you are coming with an intention that leads to the conclusion, leads the observer, human or machine, to the conclusion that there is a specific purchasing interest then the system, the AI, can in the moment, very personalized, because they have a, an audience of one at that time, serve me with that content. And this is where the horsepower again comes into picture. Right. Because there's a lot of data, <laughs> there we are, a lot of data that needs to be crunched in very limited time. So I think, one, I think one thing you and I can both agree on completely is that there's value either whether it's b2b or b2c whatever it is in in gathering those behavioral signals yes. uh, as, you know assuming that it's all above board and, and legitimate and and i and i know you're doing it there's value in that whether or not you're going to try to deliver it something to me in real time or mm -hmm. at a later point there's undeniable value in getting the current information on my behavior because it might be different than what you have from my past behavior yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah, so there's, there's, so, so there's, there's value in that, right? Yeah, not only for the vendor, but value for me or can be value for me yes. if used appropriately. Right. Yep. On, on, so just as this website example, yeah, I come with a purchasing interest where the value for me is that I do not see, need to search much for the right information on that website. I get it served because my intent is clear. I made the intent clear. And in this situation, I want the vendor to use this intent. But I the heck do not want the day after getting blasted with whatever advertisements that are coming through whatever programmatic advertisement yes. platforms on whatever other site. And I want to get to this now because mm. this also ties into Google and HubSpot. Mm. And I yeah. and I do not want oh, yeah. to I do not want to spend the rest of the show talking about Google and HubSpot. I want to make that really clear. And I could have used that as a newsjacking headline to draw a bunch of people into this conversation today, but I did not want to do that. Um, you know, Alan, your question about how much okay. value is there really in past behavior? Um, it, it really depends. Um there can be a lot of value in past behavior in certain cases. Uh, in other cases, there's very little value, and that's that's the key. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no question that current signals are important. Like that yeah. much we can really agree upon. Um, but I want to get to this HubSpot Google thing because this is important because this is the other ingredient we need to put in this conversation now. And you and I talked about this yesterday, but there's there's a couple of problems that come to a head where you bought a camera, right? 
So, yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm right looking into it. <laughs> so you bought a camera, but unfortunately now, what Amazon, for example, is probably going to show you a lot of cameras because that's your past history, even though it's very recent. And in that case, that's not so great because you're not collecting cameras right now. You bought one no. camera. So, so you don't, so, so seeing that is a little bit like a little bit irritating, but then you start seeing it across the web on other sites. You start seeing all these camera ads on other sites. Now that's more irritating, arguably, right? Because now this starts to get into the creepy side of personalization, mm -hmm. right? Where you're kind of like, ooh, like who, who shared that information with who? And not only is it wrong that I don't want a camera anymore, but it's also creepy. And this gets in, why does this tie into Google and HubSpot? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to let you explain. <laughs> Well, let's start. Let's start from that example. Yeah? Very deliberately chosen by John because the same day I purchased this very camera on the vendor side, and the day after I got blasted with ads for precisely this camera to buy it, which was quite an expensive proposition for well that retailer who put really dozens and dozens of ads on all sorts of advertisement slots so now how does that tie into google and hubspot well that is possible due to a bunch of third-party cookies that i failed to delete right and these are going to die because they yeah. will not be placed anymore and here we come into the combination of the vast data trove that that google has about me and others plus the combination with the HubSpot technology, starting with simple things like their CMS. And all of the sudden, the third party cookie that doesn't exist anymore can become a first party cookie served by the same Google as before and for various of their clients and customers, which means that vendors still are able to personalize me in order to quote the headline of Graham who had a series of posts right <laughs> personalize me so there I think is quite some possible synergy for the vendor side regardless of whether they use the synergy f to help me achieve my business because this is what I usually want to usually want to do I I go somewhere onto a vendor side or I research something because I want to achieve an, a goal. And the goal is not to get more advertisements. The goal is to gain knowledge, purchase something, get in touch with someone. Right. But it's not to get served with ads, whether yeah. they are good ones or not. Alan, since you're in the chat right now, I'd like to ask you if you've had any good experiences with so-called hyper-personalization or one-to-one -one marketing in your life if you've experienced times where you find it effective. I I found personally that that YouTube is by far the most effective example of this where, and I think part of it is not just that it shows me a range of examples, but it also shows me a bunch of like influencers. Like for example, I listen to a lot of AI expert talks. I listen to a lot of music mm -hmm. reaction stuff. It shows me experts mm -hmm. that are listening to things that I might like. So in addition to just recommending stuff, it's showing me people that I trust that are also analyzing information. I think that's really effective. I, yeah. A lot of times I find, and this is why I think the real-time context thing is, is so tricky, is when you try too hard, you fall on your face. Like, so for example, for example, Amazon does this thing on my home devices now where if I ask it to play a song, it then subsequently plays a different song that it thinks I'm going to like. This mm -hmm. is a company that has years of music listening history behind yeah. it. It still can't guess what I want to hear next. It can't, yeah. it can't do it. And, and, and I think that's, that's what I think of as like the overreach in these scenarios. Now, mm -hmm. does that really bother me too much? No, I found it annoying and I found a way to turn the feature off. But, but in certain cases, it does get incredibly annoying to get spammed, especially when it's outside your trust parameter where you're like, wait, how did you know that? Like, I think of it kind of like, 
like mm-hmm. like it's one thing when you check into your hotel and you receive like a some kind of a discount for ordering food. It's another thing when you get a message saying, "Hey John, you know, I see your flight came in late. You must be hungry." You know, like there's a point at which it starts to get creepy. Mm-hmm. And so like how do you do that, right? This is what I think is is going to really define the success of this is how do you do it in a trustful way without getting mm-hmm. that creep factor overreach of like why you know this is where sticking to youtube and continuing that thought i think is good because they are first of all you're, they are staying within their site so you're staying in context part right. one and part two is they are omitting the hyper part because what do they do is essentially a form of progressive profiling. Right. So they, they measure based upon your account or your the identity that you use, how your interests are changing over time. And with that, they are offering you a selection of related products by, that are created by someone. And this also ties into Alan's question, how much value is there in past behavior? It's diminishing. There are some things of, well, some of our personality traits that are fairly stable. Uh, well, I can't hide my accent, for example. Yeah. And I won't till I uh, find it important enough to uh, undergo some speaking training to hide it or to adopt different accents. Yeah. And other things are changing over time. And other things are just changing all the time. So like the coffee example, sometimes I like a cappuccino. It's rare, but sometimes, and usually I have my black coffee. Now, so, and these are things that no system can guess. Right. No system can guess that I woke up with, well, and stood up on the wrong foot did have a bad sleep, did have some trouble with my kids or had an altercation with my spouse or whatever. No system can guess that. Martin says the same applies to Spotify, but I also make it hard for them as the kids use my devices. Yeah. And Martin, I think what's, what's interesting about Spotify for me is it doesn't work nearly as well as the YouTube algorithm, even though Spotify has just as much information on my purchasing history. But this is what I find fascinating about this topic. Like, like, like Spotify will show me like a list of songs I might like, and it mm-hmm. just, it's off. It, it doesn't get it right. And I think yeah. like there's something about the magic of getting this right that is difficult. And, yeah. and, but one of the keys is not trying too hard. And I think, you know, that's, that's this interesting thing. So I'm going to put B2B to the side for a sec, but I do want to say that just to wrap it up, the Google HubSpot thing Thomas, we need to kind of put a ribbon on that. That's thus the interest in HubSpot by Google, right? That's why Mm -hmm. we can't dismiss this rumor out of hand because HubSpot has a lot of the kind of date customer data and approach to getting that data that Google's going to need going forward, right? So that's why this is an interesting rumor mill thing to think about. The technology combination is interesting as well. And the other thing is Google has something this might be a side point, but Google has something like a business apps division, which is right. more or less foundational technology so far. They do not have the front-end applications that really make that, well, make business apps happen, apart from the product uh, productivity right. applications where they are pretty good, actually. Yeah. So in this There's another way it might go into, but the marketing portion is something where they could get really well, or well, actually the advertisement part of the marketing portion. This is, would be my bet, my speculation. Right. Okay. Well, if it actually gets real serious, we can revisit the whole discussion, but I think it is an interesting rumor to discuss on a certain level because of that. Now, this whole B2B to B2C thing, I do want to acknowledge one of the interesting things in my debate with Sweezy is, to a large extent, it's not really B2B versus B2C anymore. It's more complex purchases versus non-complex purchases is the better way to define Mm -hmm. it. But I'm just using B2B 
and B2C shorthand for that reason, just because it's easier just than saying complex mm-hmm. and non-complex purchases again and again. But um, but I'm going to make the argument that for B2B slash complex purchases, you don't need to think about hyper-personalization in the moment. Because if if I'm a B2B decision maker and I'm making a software decision, I, I don't need you to be pinging me in real time to try to influence my real-time decisions when I'm trying to think about whether to get a lift or walk to the store mm-hmm. before it rains, whether I'm trying to figure out like yeah. whether I'm going to file my deadline today or Monday. And in the backdrop, I'm going to make an, a cloud ERP purchasing decision. I don't need you to try to influence me in the moment. That That's not even necessary, I don't think, with complex purchases. Mm-hmm. But I do think it... Now, now th- that doesn't mean that the signals that we described are not important. Mm-hmm. They are. It's just that I don't think you need to do it in the moment. You just need to figure out how to stay connected to me week to week with information and, and relevant communications. So that's a different discussion we can have in a moment. But let's, mm-hmm. for the moment, think about when it does matter with more simple purchasing decisions where if I'm going to influence your decision, I do need to reach you soon, right? Like like if if I'm thinking of like buying my solar glasses and stuff, you want to influence me right now because I'm going to make that decision. That's not next week. That's this weekend. Yeah. You, you know? should know well that uh, the main difference, there are two main differences. One is the complexity with that the impulse buying yeah. propensity. And well, looking at the solar glasses, well, there's a definite deadline. The, the next one yep. where this thing will get used is probably years of 2044 so. man i'm <laughs> yeah i think i'm not not going to plan ahead for that just yeah, yet uh, probably not yeah <laughs> so i mean the, the difference that this causes is you do not only want to influence in the right moment which is where it comes to b2b but every moment and this is where it's getting used to uh, serving ads all the time, everywhere, wh- wherever I am out, wh- wherever I move. Yeah. Right. So this is, again, an example where old data doesn't matter anymore. After the weekend, so on Monday, that, that piece of data is quite ir- irrelevant. So I wouldn't agree to a statement like it is not necessary in the moment in complex purchases, but the the number of moments differ where it matters. So if if it comes to buying an ERP system, well, I research on the the ERP vendor side, and at that moment when I'm there, you better serve me with the right stuff. If I'm on Genomica, you better not. (laughs) But but, right, but even if, yeah, it's not going to happen on our website, but... (laughs) <laughs> but e- even if I don't get you at that moment, though, yeah. I, there's there's going to be more opportunities. That the ho- and the whole point is that it, I would argue in a B two B context, the better model is the opt in community. Now that doesn't mean that you don't need yeah. that you don't need to also leverage that data with various kinds of yeah. analytics and AI. I'm not I'm not saying that, but it the better it, way in B two B is for you to say, hey, I'm really interested in staying in touch with you as a vendor, and because I like the kind of information you provide. I like the influencers that, yeah. that are connected to you. Send me your emails, send me your updates, send me your videos on AI. Just keep in touch with me. Like To me, that's the biggest thing that the B2B vendors need to accomplish is to stay in touch with people over a longer period of time. And yeah, the signal data happens, but the thing is you have, you don't, the stakes are not as high in the sense of influencing that purchase in that moment. But I do agree with you that, you, that it's nice if you can also like be on the site where you're researching and make sure that comes up. Mm-hmm. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying that you have more than one shot at it. And as a result, maybe don't be too aggressive about interrupting people and pissing them off with creepy behavior because you don't need to. If you can do it without creeping them out, then great. But you don't you, have to roll the dice on that. You don't need to for me as a consumer as well. No, you don't. But you need to find a way to reach me in real time about my solar glasses because I'm buying them yeah. this weekend. You know, yeah. so the stakes are a little bit higher, yeah. and and that's why I think consumer brands are willing to put up with what I call collateral damage of offending people with yeah. things that aren't quite the right. Because if you're a consumer brand, hey, just send the solar glass coupon to every single person on our email list because it's now or never, right? 
So anyone who's shown any inclination towards this, mm-hmm. we're just going to friggin' send the mm-hmm. email. And, mm-hmm. and, and if a few people don't like it and unsubscribe, then the hell with it. But I think in B2B, in B2B, you have to think a little bit differently about the alienation factor of just spamming people with things for short-term gains. <laughs> I do think that, yeah, howdy, Jeremy. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> there, I do think that... Actually, the stakes of getting it wrong are higher in the in the B two B environment. Yeah? Right. If if you antagonize me there, there is a big deal yep. lost. If you antagonize a bunch of million people in the B two C environment, who cares in flying F? Exactly. Yeah, so that's, and that's exactly why many many vendors. Are not actually they are not hyper personalization or well, personalizing. What they are doing yeah. is actually they they productize. They they send out highly irrelevant in often cases yep. information about their products for their purposes and not for mine. So and this is possible because of the grunt they have at their hand. Yep. So, so they're this basically is- abusing it. Right. So this is one thing I want to get across to B2B companies and vendors is there's a cost to the collateral damage of of marketing to people in heavy handed ways. There's a cost to that. In the consumer space, I can't make that argument, unfortunately, because Hilton doesn't care if I'm pissed off about the fact that they sent me a vacation email, even though all of my hotel travel with Hilton is business travel. They don't care. Um Jeremy hates e- email. And, and I think that's a good example. And so this is kind of what I wanted to get into. So I'm really interested. Has Does anyone have any examples of hyper-personalization in their lives that they actually appreciated and that felt right in terms of not just accuracy, but it didn't feel creepy and it actually engaged them? I'd like to hear examples of this from the audience and also from you, Thomas. And I'm especially mm-hmm. interested if anyone has received a hyper-personalized email that felt appropriate to them because I have yet to receive a hyper-personalized email either from a so-called AI or from an individual like using AI type. Now, obviously, hyper-personalized is different if it's like a one-to-one, if it's someone crafting me a message. But I'm just saying like from a machine-generated context, I have yet to receive a hyper-personalized email. And I I really want to bear down on this because I think email while it's only one medium is a great example of of the idea mm. if in theory if you can do one to one right you should be able to get the email right, right right because that's a classic example of communicating to one person yeah and there is i don't by the way jeremy um, <laughs> which has a which has a good reason so i jeremy don't... i jeremy i just covered youtube yeah, a while yeah, back but yeah. i but i i i i would yeah. put youtube right at the top of of getting this right um, but I explained also the reasons for that, which is YouTube doesn't yeah. try too hard. YouTube gives you a range of yeah. choices for your moods. Thomas, interestingly enough, doesn't have that same result on YouTube, but that's because he maintains separate profiles, which is confusing mm. to the algorithm. Yeah, and I switch off the, well, I disallowed Google to track me. So I, that's why the, his next comment. So I don't get interesting vendor ads <laughs> because first of all, I consider them all as not interesting and secondly they are not personalized at all but hopefully hopefully jeremy says he gets ads from interesting vendors on youtube i don't think i've ever gotten an interesting vendor ad but that's that's interesting that he gets that on youtube but getting into something that is personalized and good yeah we need to step out of the marketing domain so let's take Flight, you used the example of flight delay. Are you hungry? Yeah. But the information about the flight delay, hey, your flight is going to be delayed by two hours. So there's no need to get to the airport right now. This is personalized, probably not hyper personalized. It is not in a marketing environment, it's a service environment. Right. And I think that's incredibly helpful because oh, for who sure. loves being on an airport for, for long times. <laughs> Yeah, and and I and I I'm gonna I want to push for hyper personalized examples because I think you can come up with other things like that that are personalized by opt in segment that actually works. Like um and 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 trip it to some extent does that for me with somewhat of a one to one thing mm-hmm. where it sends me like my connection stuff, but but obviously it's sending that to every person with connections. Yeah. But like yeah. 
I think that works from an opt-in perspective, but that's a little bit different. And, you know, one of the things when I wrote about hyper a while back, I talked about that I, I still think I'm still a big believer in some level of super user configuration, making the hyper personalized experience possible where, mm-hmm. where the system isn't guessing, but the user is actively helping. But the interesting thing is a lot of apps have shied away from allowing me to configure things so precisely. But like, so for example, in the Starbucks app, like I've started to program in like my favorite Starbucks, my favorite orders. And this applies to airports too, right? So mm-hmm. like if I see a long line at a Starbucks at an airport, I can call up like a favorite, I can quickly order and like bypass the entire line. But that's because this the the system met me halfway, which I think is a very effective mm-hmm. way to do this kind of thing where it doesn't try to guess everything, but it puts me in a position to configure things that that serve my best interest. And I think that works very well. But I'm just really, really curious if anyone has good examples of hyper-personalized whatever. Take it out of the realm of marketing if you want. I don't care. Thomas, do you have one that like really works for you? No, it's probably all similar. So if it works, it is actively initiated by the customer. Like right. your favorite, yeah. What what happens there? You you just push a button, order now, and then you're getting into their ordering system at a point right. in their sequence, which happens to be earlier than the fifth guy in the queue. Hence, you get your coffee faster than this guy. Yeah, and feels pretty good too, especially yeah, when you have a tight connection. Yeah, uh, unless unless everybody is doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then and it then, doesn't feel good at all, right? The, yeah. yeah. So, but. but the the basic point is personalization even personalization works well if it is done in cooperation with me yes yeah so and this is what's not really happening and this is what's often also not really what interests the vendors yes Exactly. Because they want automagical AI goodness. Yeah, they don't well, they don't yeah. want to have scenarios that include humans participating in the preference setting. Yeah, and they're in looking inside way. out, they're not outside in. Yep. So they are looking at themselves, yep. at their benefit and not at mine. So if they start and this is where uh, your B2B examples are the other way around. Because well the stakes uh, the stakes are just high you know, if either they make a couple of millions of, of a deal or not and right well if they want to do it or if they want to make this deal they better look at what i really want and not just push something down my throat that doesn't really help right yeah so, yeah i mean and a big thing with b2b vendors is to be able to engage customers in much broader conversations yeah. about the industry problems that they're having uh, be able to you know, this goes back to the whole challenger sale thing of like, instead of selling people a product, like give them information they don't have, mm-hmm. show them opportunities in the mm-hmm. market they're missing, yeah. Sh- you know, show them, you know, how to address the current problems they're having with talent and automation and everything yeah. else. Like, like there's a big opportunity there. But, but to me, like, like while I see the role of hyper personalization and all of that, I, all I'm trying to say is that it's a longer, relationship oriented process yeah. that that is more about like like one of the things I always am impressed with when I go to shows uh with really smart vendors is how many prospects are there experiencing the whole community and just being mm-hmm. a part of the show and how much confidence when you talk with the prospects that gives them. Like I just sat down with these partners that do these really cool add-ons that I didn't know about. But the beauty of the whole thing is that the there's no pressure to immediately be like, hey, you know, uh, you know, we know that, you know, you're on site, you know, you could sign the deal this this week and it'd be done. Like the vendor doesn't have to do that because they know that the sale cycle doesn't end like yeah. like my solar glasses. So no. they so they can be a little more respectful of the process. But um, I just think it's really interesting that that no one seems to really have examples in the um, granted we don't have a huge chat today because i organized this show pretty last minute but not seeing any hyper personalized examples and I, I think that's just because this is really hard if you if the bar is like oh like the ai system can just know what you need and do it i think that's a really really high bar i think a much more interesting bar is somewhere in the middle 
like where we just talked about where customer preferences are still incorporated into the process and 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 then it can work like just to give you one example like from the home front like like i have different genres of music at times and like for me a lot of times jazz is really nice in the morning because it's just kind of like kind of like loose and comfortable and like you know dude you can handle your day like like it's a good vibe Mm -hmm. for me in the morning so what i did is i configured a routine on on my amazon devices that allow me to conjure up that you know i get the weather and the sports and then it goes right into my random play but Mm -hmm. it's a it's a playlist i've already built so it's it's making decisions but it's within a context that i created and i think that kind of personalization is Mm -hmm. really powerful but a lot of vendors i think shy away from it because like i said they want automagical solution Mm -hmm. that don't involve any effort on the customer's part because what they're thinking is like well you know john did that but not every person's going to want to sit down and like define that's the weakness that's the weakness in that is that the super user configurators like me are, aren't that common, right? Most people just want to just go on with their day and have everything work. But unfortunately, I don't think the AI systems are good enough for that. Let's look at Jeremy's questions and maybe you can answer them. Jeremy says, perhaps we're transitioning from push marketing back to pull marketing. And, and, and um, your guest that's coming up next Tuesday, Graham Hill, he has some really interesting stuff on push and pull with personalization. Mm-hmm. So here's a shameless plug for your show next week, Tuesday, <laughs> yeah. what time? Uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, yeah. 1 p.m. Eastern, 7 yep. p.m. Central European. Listen to a real personalization yeah. expert yeah. join yeah. Uh, CRM convos with data to back up his points. That's going to be yeah. a good one. Jeremy That's says, I do, however, believe we're transitioning back to user preferences and how we interface. Yeah. I, I hope so, Jeremy. I'm not so sure, but I, I really hope so. What do you think, Thomas? Well, I hope that Jeremy is right, but I feel he is not. The yeah. also, also with this comment before, I want to wish that we are going back to pull marketing and because of, that's how I'm wired. So I, I don't care about advertisements, not at all. But when I'm looking for something, I want to get information about this something. What is the best solution for my problem that I want to solve right now? So this is pull. Right. Instead, I get well. My the example was <laughs> troves and troves of ads for the same camera that I already bought yesterday. So <laughs> this is yep. push. Yeah. So we should get there. We need to get there. Also, in the light that this is far more effective for the vendors themselves. Provide me with something that they know of that I want. I, by the way, have a failed business venture. Epiconic is the name, which was exactly based on that. The user controls who is able to allow to talk to him at any given time. It should never have failed, Thomas. Um, It was, it did. (laughs) Probably the wrong vendor. Probably the wrong vendor. Martin says, I fully agree with Thomas. Martin, the only thing about these shows is there's a slight lag between our stream and LinkedIn, which I swear you're watching. So if you want to say what you agree with, that might be useful. Um, Jeremy says, the user doesn't define requirements well. Jeremy, by the way, this is actually one thing where I think AI could be very interesting in the future, which is instead of Like, because there's very few super user configurators like me that are willing to go into the bowels of these applications and set all this stuff up. But what I do think could take the place of that someday fairly soon is generative AI having an engaging, chatty conversation with people to ask Mm -hmm. them what it is they're interested in and then map that into, um, for example, I've been looking into knowledge graphs for this map that into a knowledge graph that can be sourced by the LLM. That's actually interesting. And that to me could be the solution because there's no way that, that, that brands are going to go back to super user configuration because there's not enough of us out there. Um, Martin says that's the worst getting ads for things I just bought. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I do want to, I do want to call out as a, as another winning example, we mentioned TikTok and YouTube. I think they have the best, recommendation mm-hmm. algorithms in the world. I, th- I actually think they're much better than Spotify and Netflix, but that's my feeling. Um, mm-hmm. But then um, I do want to call out Amazon though, because I think Amazon has a similar thing, not so much with like, they they sometimes get the thing wrong as far as like 
if I just bought a camera and then they show me a bunch of cameras. But, but in general, they do a really nice job of showing you things like shoppers that bought this, just bought that. And a lot of times there's, they're like companion products or things that are connected to what you're looking at. Um, and it's, it's, I don't think it's quite hyper personalized, but it, it's close. And, and the other thing is that the other thing I like about that setup is that then you click on those things and they have a whole host of reviews that you can read through. And this mm-hmm. is like why I think community is a really big part of, of this equation is, is connecting AI to community and opt-in communities is the winning ingredient to me in this. And, and I'll give you an example of what I don't like that Amazon has done is in Prime Video, they've gotten rid of the easy ability to look at reviews so you mm-hmm. can't see them. So all they show you is the amount of stars, which is just ridiculous because like everything has four, four and a half stars except for a handful of things. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, what does that rating even do for me? And then after I watch a show, Amazon will, will do the whole like, did you like this? Even though I'm binging the whole series, it's like, what do you think? I have it on autoplay. I'm watching the whole series. Is your AI really that dumb? So I think mm-hmm. even like Amazon's trying to figure this stuff out, but I think the way that they display sometimes related purchases and stuff in real time mm-hmm. is really smart. And, and, mm-hmm. um, but, but I don't see too many other examples of this that I think, oh my gosh, this brand really has nailed this down. No. And, and I mean, this related purchases is far preceding yep. whatever is called hyper. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And, It's also a totally different approach. Well, this But, is go, it goes into yeah. the direction that Jerry well, it, it does. Systems yeah, component. it does. Yeah, it does precede it. But I think it captures some of the real time ingredients that yeah. we're looking for here. Because yeah. it, it, what it's doing that I think is effective is it, it's in that real time moment where um, a lot of sites just really struggle with that. And you know, for, for obvious reasons, because either it's intrusive or you don't have the data. Um, yeah. So these are the dilemmas that I think are really interesting. And I think, I think um, vendors need to back off from the fantasies that hyper-personalization can guess what we need in the moment and, and think really hard about that as an ingredient and in gathering signals, but combining that with some degree of user preferences and experience design and community so that the things connect in a way where I trust you mm-hmm. and I've given you permission and we're engaging in, in, in a good way. I, I don't think we're really getting that right now. No, we are not getting it right now because they are looking at their interest, not at mine. So, and yep. there again, I, de- I defend my example. So yeah. In okay. The moment, Thomas rises in, to his defense. In, okay. In, in, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> hey, we, we need to get some heat up, right? <laughs> we can't yeah, absolutely. Agree. Let's, we can't let's, let's, agree. let's get the heat up here. So yeah. We, the, when, when I'm looking at a purchase and I'm researching a vendor on their website, then I am in the moment, I have a clear interest and then I want right now good information. And not about their opposition, or well, be maybe also about their opposition, which they are probably not prone to give me. But at that point in time, we are having a very strong real-time information. I do not necessarily need comp- um, the the community. I might need it. It might be helpful as well. But there, I have a real-time thing. I yeah. do not need that in an email two hours later or the day after. So, and that is. I, think, I, don't, I don't know though. I think I think I think the ultimate accomplishment that a vendor can have during your example, if you take that in a B2B context, mm-hmm. uh, the ultimate thing the vendor could achieve from you in that interaction mm-hmm. would be to obtain your email, which they may not have. Yeah. Like cool. I think the best thing they could get out of you being on their site in that moment is mm-hmm. is your email and permission to follow up with them. That's the right. trick is how do you do that? Yeah. Because if if you're there. What are they going to show you that's going to make you want to give them your your email? That to me is really interesting. And that's where your hyper-personalization argument, I think, does come into play. Yeah. Because th- you should show show Thomas exactly what would <laughs> what would inspire him to give you the email for more follow-up show information. Me value, yeah? Show yeah. me some value. Yeah. And exactly. this is essentially what account-based marketing is about. Right. Show me valuable information that's valuable for me right now that entices me 
that makes me want to connect even further with you, talk to you, instead of just browsing and vetting you, getting into a closer vetting. Yeah? So, and this is what many still need to get. So yes, they are doing account-based marketing, but why why are they doing that to shove even more down my throat? So push, not pull, Jeremy. Yeah. So and this is yeah, and and Jeremy says he he doesn't even want the email follow up because of specific user preferences, yeah. and that's tr and that's true, Jeremy, for some people. But the vast majority of people, in my experience, will accept emails if they are relevant to them. The key really is relevance, but yeah, you're not everyone's going to give up their email for any reason, of course. Mm. But but the problem in today's busy purchasing environment in a B two B space, mm. the problem is mm. people that show up on your website and never come back because yeah. they they found your search once. Once they're on your site, you have to mm. find a way to get them to opt in. And right now, email is just mm. the brute, the only real mechanism that works there. I mean, yeah. you you could get fancy and also give people the chance to opt in via text message. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't work nearly as well. The other thing that brands try to do is to get you to follow their social accounts. But of course, that's a much higher bar for a brand, right? Like, yeah. like follow yeah. us on this, you know. Um, but anyway, there, th there's other ways of doing it, perhaps. But the whole point is like, in that moment, how, like, how do, you, like you said, Thomas, like you have to be able to serve up relevant information yeah. without creeping out the prospect, which is always a possibility mm -hmm. if 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 later they see those ads elsewhere on the web they're going to be like what yeah. the hell and the likelihood of creeping me out is far higher when i get this information on somebody else's website or <laughs> to use jeremy's example not via email if they all of a sudden show up on my phone well <laughs> i well, I'd rather ignore an email than a text well, and, and, and Thomas, I think it's going to get worse, not better, because think yeah. about like, like, I, I suspect you probably encounter this a lot after going to events where you receive emails from various exhibitors that assume mm -hmm. you're a customer, you know, yeah. they don't. And, and it's a little frustrating on my side when I get those, because I'm like a simple search on my profile would show you that I'm not like a customer. Like I, I got one recently from one show saying they wanted to acquire our firm. Um, oh, because what? they thought, well, yeah, but <laughs> supposedly, but, but they thought we were a partner of the vendor uh, uh, and mm. I'm like, um, hello, like, did you do any research at all? But what I'm worried about, like from a personalization perspective is pretty soon that shit's going to get automated. Yeah. And then I'm going to get the so-called hyper-personalized automated version of that message, either yeah. through generative AI text or something. And it's going to be the mm -hmm. same stuff. It's going to be running shit up flagpoles. Yeah. You know, and this is and, where we started and, off with, right? Yep. It's and just, even though it's recent data, it's crappy data. It's yeah. not good data. Yeah. yeah. It's the other topic. It needs good data and it needs good usage. Just because the marginal cost of sending yet another email or yet another thousand emails is approaching zero, there's no real need in doing so. Right. But what goes down is the acceptance rate and your your spammer rating probably goes up way up right yeah so better be precise by allowing me to learn something about me well allowing your well allowing me to give something to you that i want to give something to you and allowing you to use that for the purpose i want you to use it for and none other so this and this is this would lead to real personalization. Let's call it ultra personalization. But hyper is already given. <laughs> yeah, right. Real. Yeah. We're gonna <laughs> by next year, hyper personalization's been on the junk pile yeah. and we're gonna yeah. have like some <laughs> other some other phrase. Yeah. I I uh wanna encourage the commenters to put in any final yeah. like comments in the chat and appreciate those that were posting observations on this because this this was really more just because I, I thought Thomas could help help to think through some of these things with me because I, hope I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did a lot. Did we miss anything from your perspective? I know you got a show coming up. I don't want you to have to spoil all your 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 good um content. No, we, won't, we won't spill more beans now. And <laughs> yeah. I'm quite sure that Graham has a lot to add. 
Oh yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yeah. I think the the one thing I think I would go back to is that you and I kind of agreed on on the thing around that this should just be a tool, but then like where I want to push this conversation in the future is let's understand exactly how this tool works. Like let's understand what it's good for and what it's not because we just went through a whole show without anyone providing a satisfactory example of how this can work. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It it reminds me of when I was on a podcast uh, on the retail sector and, and the host challenged me to name one large scale retail transformation that it actually worked. Um, and again, it was like, okay, <laughs> um, here I am advocating for like transformation inside of companies and I can't serve up one example, you know, so. Well, there are probably a bunch of retail transformations from running business to dead business. It's also a retail transformation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes, uh, sometimes we do need to come up with examples. What this tells me is this is a fruitful conversation, but one that has a lot of caveats and mm. man, I look forward to seeing the brands that get this right. Cause that's going to yeah. be, especially in the enterprise, right? Like I understand that personalized consumer offers lead to increased sales and stuff like that. I'm not quarreling with that, but how do we get to this deeper experience where personalized content with the aid of AI leads to more trust and better experiences on both sides and of course more revenue that's what's interesting Mm -hmm. and i don't see Uh, it yet martin look up epiconic.com failed business give the user or customer the chance to influence the results absolutely Uh, martin and and i i do think that gen ai tied to things like knowledge graphs and vector Mm -hmm. databases fed into llms is an interesting scenario here um, it's it's not totally solved and it's not going to be perfect, but I think it's interesting because we're not going back to super user input and configuration yeah. as Thomas's uh, business history illustrates. <laughs> um, Jeremy says, hyper personalization plus fashion equals style concentration plus mass bespoke and 3D body scanning. Ouch. Um, now we're bringing the TSA into this. We probably should cut our losses. Uh, <laughs> Martin says, train the Spotify algorithm. This would be yeah. less annoying. Yeah, I mean, I think music algorithms are really tough, Martin, which yeah. is one reason why, you know, music is is a great, perfect example of why human beings are so bafflingly unique, right? Yeah. The whole idea of like, you will like this, therefore you will like that is like totally crazy. Mm-hmm. Even like, I mean, I think, weren't we talking about Pink Floyd the other day, Thomas? Mm-hmm. Like, 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 even though you and I are both Pink Floyd fans, I'm willing to bet our top five favorite and least favorite Pink Floyd songs are totally different. You know what I mean? Comfort- like, comfortably numb. Okay, not totally different. I hope. <laughs> different, yes. Mm. Not in my top five, no. Well, I sort of like Shine On, which parts of it actually. Not in my top five. And Wish You Were Here. So these are... Number well, one, number one. Songs. Number one with a bullet. Okay, so we we agree on wish you were here and comfortably numb. So that's pretty obvious. But yeah. but beyond that, it's treacherous territory, and that's even within a band yeah. that that yeah. you and I both like, right? Like, yeah. and and so I think Spotify is really befuddled by by these things, right? Yeah. So yeah. of course they would be. Yeah. I'll just put in a plug for Welcome to the Machine. Big time. Not too bad as well, yeah. That, Not too bad as well. That's big for me. There's, there's um, a scarily good one on the final cut. Particularly asked, relevant to our two times, sons, right? Two sons in the sunset. Yeah, that right. Gives me the two shivers sons, every right. Time. Yeah, that absolutely. Gives me the shivers all the time. Well, I'm sure viewers hate to leave on a cliffhanger about whether I'm going to get my solar glasses for myself and my mother. Uh, so you will. I'll have to I'm update. Quite sure. <laughs> have to update LinkedIn uh, yeah. for that. Um, yeah, Martin post wants- a picture of you wearing them. Oh, uh, Meg, coming oh. in for wish you were here, mm. comfortably numb. Come on, Meg, welcome to the machine. This is this is There's basically ones our, on animals as our well, lives, by the way. Man. Yeah, which is not at all my favorite, right? So Spotify is totally befuddled. It wouldn't even know what Pink Floyd tracks to serve up to our group right now. Mm. You know. Meg would be like, please don't play Welcome to the Machine. I'd be like, please don't play Animals. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we would agree on our number one and number two, but we'd be like, 
maybe I don't need to hear those songs for the millionth time um, today. Anyway. No. <laughs> well, thanks all for joining this. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Thank Have you. a great weekend. This was really yeah, interesting. Was and yeah. By the way, someday we're going to do a more formal version of this show. That's why this one was called a workshop, because mm. I want to really put a personalization expert in the chair, but I needed Thomas's brain power first so that I can really have my ducks in a row. So I think now I do, Thomas. Thank you for your time. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, all. thanks for having me. See you. Bye. Bye.